Hey, we're back with another story, everyone. Uh, things may look a little different. That's okay. I think I wanted to see as we go into January. I've been doing this for about a year. Um, it's been pretty good. I like the way it looks. Um, I do think that I'd like to change a few things. There's still a little bit that I want to tweak as I go forward into uh, a 2024. So to do that, I think that I want to have a little more face-to-face -face, uh, connection with some of the stories that I, that I look over with you guys. Um, to get started, I guess the first thing I want to look at is something that kind of took the world by storm as we were in 2023 leaving out of October, something that you probably saw all over the internet. You, you As a person who watches this channel, you've probably seen it. Uh, and I think it, I don't need to explain it. It's right here at the top of the screen. Uh, Five Nights at Freddy movie that recently came out. Um, I don't think it's a secret. Um, you can see it right here on my poster. Uh, as an adult, I am still a fan of the franchise. I think I've been watching it for long enough that, you know, I still was really excited when the movie came out. Um, and I wasn't super disappointed. I think, you know, spoilers, not yet. Um, but I think all in all, I think I wasn't, it could have been worse is what I will say. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump on that bandwagon right now. And I want to talk about it. I want to look it over and I want to go ahead and give a recap and give you my thoughts as we, as we look into this. Um, so, so what is the movie really, right? We know that it came out in 2023, um, Blumhouse. Um, I kind of posted a little bit on the channel, uh, talking about how I went and saw the puppets at Universal, which was pretty cool. Um, but basically it's this kind of an amalgamation of the games and the books. It, it's kind of a connection between the original first Five Nights at Freddy's, but also Silver Eyes. If you haven't read Silver Eyes, there's a little bit of that in here too. Um, I'm not adding a ton new here. I think this has been analyzed uh, to death, honestly. I think it's been talked about to death, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time here talking about it. But just know that it, it's it's not really canon. You're not going to see a direct translation of any of the stories or any of the games, honestly. It's, it's kind of its own thing, adding like a third uh, arm of the canon, if you will. But it, it start, there are some elements that are the same. So, right, 2023, Blumhouse made it. Um, you know, it, just keep that in mind as we go forward. I'm not going to be the end all be all when it comes to lore, who these characters are. Right. So I'm just going to kind of approach this just as if it's its own thing. So with that out of the way, um, before I get started, I just want to say, if you're here, you're watching this, there's going to be spoilers. Just like in all the videos I, I kind of cover, the point of these videos is to have, if you want to come back and you want to look back at something and you want to quickly recall what happened. That's kind of the purpose of these. If you haven't seen the movie, it's not hard to find. I mean, it's on Peacock. You can buy it now. Uh, it's not super expensive. Uh, just if you get a chance, go see it first and then you can come back and watch it. But if you are still here, um, just be aware. I'm going to be spoiling some things in it. Okay. So with that out of the way, let's just go ahead and jump right into the story. Okay. All right. So we start following a security guard. It's some random security guard. I don't think they really mentioned his name. I'm sure some people de dived into it a little more and they, they have this character's name, but it's really irrelevant. It's just following a security guard. He's clearly running from something, this little bit of a panic inducing. He's he's sprinting away. I think he's been running from Foxy essentially. Um, and he's killed off screen. I mean, you get to see this torture mask. Eventually I think it's called Torture Freddy is what people have been calling it. But it's this big mask that has like these saw blades in it. And uh, essentially he's killed off screen. Uh, it sets the tone, I think, um, right off the bat. We know that we're not going to get to see any uh, gratuitous violence here. There's not lots of blood. There's not a lot of spookiness, I guess I would say. If you, if you play the game at all, you know that there's some tension. I mean, it does die down pretty quick once you kind of know what the gist of the game is, but there's a lot of jump scares in the game. And in this first scene, you kind of already can tell what the tone of this movie is going to be. It's it's meant to be horror kind of, but it's it's also not gonna be gratuitous. I mean, the rating alone kind of speaks to that. Right, so then, then we're brought in to meet our main character, our protagonist of the story, right? Mike, Mike Schmidt. It, he is the name that's on the, the checks. If, you, if you've ever watched my um, recap of the first game, uh, you can go back and watch it. It kind of gives you an idea of what that was about. Um, it's not my best video. I think I'm hopefully slowly getting better at them, but if you want, you can go back, you can check it out. Um, but basically Mike Schmidt is the person you theoretically play as in those games. At least that's whose name's on the check once you finish all the nights. Um, in this case, you're playing as him. It's the guy from Hunger Games. He's a meme. Everybody kind of knows him at this point. Um, but he's seeing this adult man 
kind of chasing this kid through the mall. Uh, and you kind of get the sense that he's already carrying some baggage with him because he immediately jumps to the worst case scenario and starts chasing this man down the mall and then jumps on him and just kind of is beating the shit out of him in the in the fountain, right? Uh, obviously, as a mall security guard, uh, a bit overkill for what's going on. Turns out that it's not what he thinks it is, which is some guy trying to abduct a child in the middle of a mall in bright daylight, but it turns out it's the child's father, right? Um, he obviously gets fired, which means that he loses his job. And this is something that seems to be a trend with him. He's lost several jobs at this point, And uh, he's find ourselves in the next scene. And we're meeting a person named Steve Raglan, who is a career counselor, like introduces us to the fact that um, Mike has lost so many jobs. He's taking care of his sister. He needs the money, but he just can't seem to keep a position down. And I think that has something to do with something that happened in his background, something to do with what we'll cover a little more later, but he's carrying some um, trauma with him as he goes forward. And it's, and it's causing him to have a little bit of a hard time holding a position, right? Even if it means he's not fully able to take care of his, uh, his sister. Um, but Steve, the career counselor is trying to set him up with something, trying to reach out to him, trying to say, you know, we've given you all these opportunities and you keep getting fired. It seems like he doesn't really want to keep his job, right? Um, but he does tell him that there's one job that he could take. The problem is it's going to be nights and it's going to be a security guard position. And all in all, it's not the best position. Um, he's not really selling it. Um, and, you know, Mike's telling him that I can't take this. It's a nighttime position. And he did kind of reveal his last name here, Schmidt, and it does seem to trigger something. And we'll get to that more later too. It's clear that Steve Raglan here, this character, um, does know Mike, or at least recognizes his last name when he says it, um, which kind of leans him in, or kind of makes him want to give him that position for that security guard. Um, all in all, Mike turns it down initially. He says, I can't take it. It's nights. I've got to look out for my sister. He, he can't even barely pay uh, babysitters that he does have. And he goes back home. Steve gives him a business card, says, call me back if you're still interested. Uh, and Mike goes back. And in our next scenes, we start to see this, what I think is actually kind of an interesting idea. It's this dream theory thing that they're playing on here. And I, and I think it's kind of clever in a lot of ways because dream theory is something that was kind of covered in the Five Nights at Freddy's 4 game. The thing that kind of led to a lot of uh, backlash from fans that say, oh, that whole game was a, in, a, in a dreams. And I think it's kind of tongue in cheek here. But at the same time, it's also a decent story element. I think it's kind of well done. I don't see this happen a lot. But basically, Mike goes to sleep. He plays some nature sounds. He's looking up at this poster that says um, Nebraska on it. Um, and he kind of brings himself into his dream. It's this lucid dreaming kind of thing where he can be in the dream, but be aware that he's in the dream. And I think the idea here is in this dream, he finds himself at a campsite in Nebraska from when he was a kid with his parents and his young brother. And this is kind of where that trauma comes in. I guess when he was young, um, Mike was supposed to be watching his younger brother. Uh, his younger brother's name is Garrett. He's supposed to be watching Garrett, but he looks away briefly and Garrett ends up getting abducted by this man in this car, right? So the guy in the car drives away and Mike never sees him again. So he's, he's kind of going through these dreams um, to see if he can recall any information from that moment in time, from that moment where he kind of let his brother down where he feels responsible to some extent that his brother was taken and he wants to see if he can go back to that moment in time in his dreams and catch any details that maybe he missed at the time. That's the premise, right? It, it seems like he's been doing this for a long time um, to no avail though. So he hasn't, it hasn't worked yet, but he keeps trying every night. He's on these medications every night. He's trying to do it and every night um, just isn't working out. So he wakes up. And this is where we're kind of introduced to his younger sister, his other sibling, uh, a girl named Abby. And this is where some fans kind of theorize that her name Abby is kind of an anagram of baby and you know, blah, blah, blah. Get to that. I don't think that's all relevant right now. I don't think it's all super important, but interesting to know. But basically, she's at this place. I don't really know if it's a daycare center or a child protective service. I don't really know what it is, but she's at this educational center. Clearly, her his little sister is playing with other kids. There's it's it's kind of a school setting, so maybe it's a school. I don't really know. 
they don't kind of describe what it is, but there is some debate with this woman who's looking over the facility where she's talking about custody of Abby. I, currently, Mike has custody as the older brother and the parents are gone. They're out of the picture. They don't really describe what happened. Mike just says that, you know, his parents are out of the picture and he's kind of the, in the custody. I, it, presumably they're dead, but I don't want to make assumptions here because it's not outright stated, I guess. Um, but there's a talk with his aunt. His aunt is here. Um, I think her name's Jane. Um, she's trying to fight for custody for Abby and take Abby away from him. And he doesn't want that to happen, obviously. And it seems like she just wants it for the money. I'm not sure how much money she would actually get out of, you know, getting custody of this young girl, but she does seem hell bent on getting it. So she serves papers to Mike in this office saying that she's going to fight for custody. She's going to take it to court. And you know, Mike really needs to get a job at this point. If he's going to fight his aunt, who's got a lawyer in this case, uh, if he's going to fight her, he needs to, he needs to get a job. He needs to make sure that he seems presentable, that he can take care of his, his younger sister. He'll never really win. Right. Um, so he calls back Steve at this point since he needs that job. And he says, you know, I'll take it. If that's all he can get at the moment, he'll take it. Um, and Steve goes into this really cool scene where he's on the phone. And I think it kind of loses this phone guy incident or the phone guy montage from the first game. It's, re it's really well done. It's actually one of my more favorite scenes in the movie. Um, we have Steve who's kind of talking about Freddy's as Mike is showing up to the facility and, it, and it's a really well done scene, right? So we see the outside of Freddy's building. It's kind of run down. It's older. It's clearly seen some stuff. It's seen better days, but for some reason, the owner of the building still wants to keep it open. He just hires a security guard to keep the facility running, right? To keep make sure nobody's breaking in, to make sure nothing's getting out. Like, so all he has to do is he just has to go in there, watch the cameras, make sure nothing crazy happens, and that's it. And he gets paid for it, right? That's the idea. He just has to make it till the next morning. And this kind of is similar to the game. I think that's where it's well done. You have five nights in the game, you're a security guard, and all you have to do is watch the cameras. So it's nothing crazy here, right? While he's in the office, though, he has to do that nightly ritual of his, right? Where he he takes his medication, he listens to the sounds, and he does that lucid dream thing again and wakes himself back up in the woods. Um, this time, things are a little different, though. He's, he, everything kind of plays out the same. He sees the car, but this time, in, in addition to the car, he also sees five younger kids. And I don't think it's anything crazy to say that these five kids clearly relate to the animatronics that are in the facility, including Golden Freddy. I don't think that... Um, nobody didn't see that coming. It's clear that that's who they are. And I think because he's in the building now, obviously the spirits are there and, you know, they're able to reach him in his dreams and they start communicating him this way. Uh, he sees these five kids, he kind of approaches them and they just kind of bolt, right? Um, one of the, I guess it's supposed to be spooky. It's, it's not really, it's kind of silly. Um, but I like the idea. It kind of is a nice little interlude in between, um, his action inside the, you, you have to do something or else you're just going to be sitting in this office with security it's not as fun as it would be in the game where you're actually doing something so it's kind of a nice way to break up those kind of scenes um after that he hears a buzzer going off outside and it turns out there's this police officer standing outside and he looks on the camera he sees her he goes and opens the door it's a, a woman her name is vanessa she's kind of talking to him she's trying to figure out what's going on um and mike lets her in mike says you know come on in obviously she's a cop what's he gonna do uh, she comes in and she kind of understands she's been here before. It's clear that she knows what Freddy's is. She knows how it works. She knows how it operates. And so she's she's actually walking him around at this point. And she shows him the stage with the animatronics on it. And this is our first scene where we really get to see all the animatronics on stage. Uh, we get to see Bonnie. We get to see Freddy. We get to see Chica and a little bit of Foxy, but, you know, not so much with him. They're, they're doing their show. Uh, it's really well done. Um there's kind of a moment between them. I think that it's kind of revealing who her character is. Um, she clearly knows more than she's letting out. I think that that's pretty obvious here, but we don't know what, we don't really know if we can trust her yet. It's suspicious, right? She showed up, but I think that there's nothing really weird about her at this moment. Right. Um, then we go back out and we start to see the next scene. Um, Mike's coming back home the next morning. Um, he's talking to the babysitter it goes on and on his babysitter is this is this girl that is working for him and 
basically she has been working for his aunt even though she's been watching Abby, she's been secretly working behind the scenes for his aunt, trying to find evidence about how he's a terrible person, how he shouldn't be watching Abby. And she goes back and they're at this diner and she's trying to say, oh, you know, I haven't really found anything, but the aunt's trying to say, we need to do something to get him fired from this new position because, you know, obviously she's trying to take him to court and it looks better if he hasn't been able to take care of himself and he's not qualified to take care of Abby. Um, so the girl that's watching Abby is... Uh, looking out for her, she's basically says that she she thinks that he's a good guy. She's not being super helpful, but she brings her brother, right? And her brother says that what they can do is they can stage a break-in, right? They can say, uh, well, if we break in during the day, what we'll do is we'll just destroy the place and we will make it look bad. It'll clearly show that he didn't know what he was doing and he'll get fired for it, right? So that's kind of what they do. They wait for him to leave. They go back, they break into Freddy's and in it's kind of in the daytime at this point and they start just destroying the place. They toss everything, they break everything down. Um, and this is where we get, I, I feel like they needed to introduce some characters into the dine or into Five Nights or into Freddy's because they needed the puppets to kill somebody. That's, that's all they're there for, let's be honest. They don't have names, they're not important maybe except for the babysitter, but even her, I think the whole premise of her story is just to act as a catalyst for getting more people into the diner so that we can see these puppets actually do something. I mean, they they have these Jim Henson puppets that are really well done. They need to see these things in action, right? We need to see them kill somebody or else what's the threat of the animatronics, right? So they slowly, one by one, they start to pick off these thieves. We see Chica and, Cup, and, uh, and the cupcake, you know, just kill this person in the kitchen. Kind of a silly scene, but whatever, it works. Uh, we see um, we see uh, Foxy chase somebody down. We see Bonnie kill somebody in a closet. I mean, all in all, it's nothing crazy. Everything's kind of done off screen. There's not a lot of blood. We do see one body get chomped in half, though. It's Again, it's silhouetted behind a door, so you don't see it all. All in all, this movie's not gr grotesque. Like, I keep saying that, but I think people have an impression of what it will be, so they don't want to watch it, but it's really mild. It's, a, it's not a bad movie. You've seen movies like, nope, you've probably seen worse than this movie. It's just, it's really mild horror. Okay, so but we do see a body vaguely get chomped in half. And I would say that's about as grotesque as the whole movie ever gets. But I think that was a kind of a cool scene. Um, another moment in that montage is the final one when the babysitter is approaching Freddy's head and then this hand pops out at her. I think that was kind of cool. Could have been a better jump scare given what the franchise is. And I think that's across the board. It's the one case in a horror movie where I think you had an excuse to lean into more jump scare, cheap scares. And I guess it's respectable they didn't, but I, I think it could have benefited from it. Without that, it's kind of like you're waiting for something to happen and the puppets are just kind of there, right? I mean, even the stuff that they do is completely off screen. So they're not very threatening. I mean, the red eyes are cool, but they're just not really threatening, right? So with all that being said, that means he's lost his babysitter at this point. That means he has nobody to watch Abby. Um, they don't know where she's at. I mean, obviously she's dead, but Mike doesn't know that at the point. So he's forced to bring Abby with him the next night back to the restaurant. He needs to keep the job. He can't just not go. He has to take her. So she's kind of sleeping out there, but while she's there, she gets the chance to meet the animatronics, which is a kind of cool scene. They're circling her. She's kind of screaming. Mike runs out to save her. I see the idea to see what's going on. He sees the animatronics. They're circling around her. And it's, I mean, after what we just saw them do, I think it's like, oh, oh what are they going to do to her? But, you know, they're just playing with her. It turns out that she's she can draw with them and she can kind of communicate with them a little bit um, through her drawings. And they're not threatening to her at all, right? They actually seem like they're kind of friendly to her. Um, and that's kind of cool, right? So over the next couple of nights, they go back home. Mike talks a little bit about his his past with Vanessa, and they kind of talk a little bit about it. Um, and then eventually, Vanessa, Abby, and Mike go back to the, you know, some stuff kind of flies by, some more stuff in the woods. Vanessa, Abby, and Mike, they go back into um, Freddy Fazbear's. They, they build this big fort and a kind of a silly scene with the animatronics where they decide to build a fort out of tables and such. And they're all in there. Eventually, though, um, Abby goes back up to the stage and she tries to like strum the guitar of Bonnie's guitar and gets electrocuted. 
And that's kind of where things kind of take a twist. Um, what happens is uh, Vanessa kind of says that don't bring her back. Don't bring Abby back anymore. I don't want to see her back at the at the restaurant. And so they take her home and that's it. That's about it, right? Um, but eventually, you know, we're confronted with this idea that Abby is drawn back to the restaurant eventually. Uh, I think it's Golden Freddy kind of finds her. Uh, Mike goes back into a dream again. I'm, I'm kind of skipping forward a little bit. Uh, things get a little fast at this point, but Mike goes back into a dream. He asked Abby before they go to the fort whether she could, he, he's kind of aware now that there's ghosts in these suits. I skipped over that because it's, he just jumps right into it, right? He's just aware there's ghosts in the suits. Now the kids are in there, they're kids and they're killed. And he sees it in Abby's drawings and he's like, Hey, can you talk to them? Can you ask them what happened to my brother? Can you ask them what happened to our brother? And she agrees. And while they're at that fourth thing, they ask and she kind of gets an answer. And, um, you know, the next day, you know, he's dreaming, he's going back to the thing. Um, one of, I think, I think it's presumably it's golden Freddy as a child in the woods in his dream says that, you know, they, he kind of feeds him a almost like five, uh, Freddy Krueger esque, like, here's this dream world you can live in. It's got your brother here. You're happy. Everything you ever wanted. You can have this, but you just have to give us what we want. And what they want is they want his sister. They want Abby. They want her to live with them forever. And if he can agree to it, which I don't know why they need his permission, honestly, um, then they'll let him be in this world and they'll presumably take Abby. I don't know why, but for some reason he agrees to it. I don't know why. I has no clue. It kind of comes out of nowhere. He's doing everything for her. But I think it's just that he can't let it go. He finally sees answers are within his grasp, and then he does it. Uh, he immediately takes it back. Again, I don't know why any of that matters. I don't know why they need his permission. I don't know what the purpose is here. But while all this is happening, um, Golden Freddy appears in her house. Um, you can kind of see it because it's it's a messed up version of Freddy. Um, it appears in her house, kills the aunt, presumably. I mean, you see her laying on the floor. I don't know if she's truly dead, but I think that's what's implied. Um, gets in a cab because why not and then they drive to Freddy's and now Mike has to go rescue her before he can do that though he's met with Vanessa um, they get weapons they get tasers she kind of explains what he needs to do to destroy the puppets and he goes out he asks her why don't you come help me why don't you come you know why don't you come do this why don't you come save us you, you're clearly afraid of something and she just says she can't do it she admits to him that um, the person who killed all those children, the person who did it, his name is William Afton, and she admits to him that that's her dad, right? So we, we kind of now know that in this case, William Afton, who we know from the games and the books or whatever, I, I don't really know all the lore yet of it, uh, hopefully as I read through them, I will, but she admits that that's her dad. So we get this weird combo now of William Afton from the games or, or the books, um, we have Vanessa, who's from like Security Breach, who's now for some reason Afton's child and who's who. It's kind of a reverse of some of the games, I think, the characters. Um, but basically she can't. So Mike goes out there. He goes with the taser. He goes with uh, the cow, cattle prod um, and he goes to save his sister. He takes on the animatronics on stage. He like electrifies them and slowly he's taking on the uh, corrupted animatronics who are clearly out to get him at this point they're not friends with abby i think they're there for her they want to turn her into one of them into somebody that can stay with them and be with them all day and he doesn't want that to happen so he kind of confronts them um and this works but while this is happening while he's saving his sister um she's she's kind of running around too she kind of clearly knows what's going on the puppets are not acting like her friends they're kind of out to hurt her and there's this cool scene I just want to point this out before we move on to the last bit of this uh, of this movie. There's this cool scene where she's hiding in the arcades, and that's directly lifted from Silver Eyes. It's it's, it's a really cool scene. I like that where Charlie was hiding in the uh, arcade system while Foxy kind of hunted her down, and I feel like that was a direct reference to that scene. So this is what I was kind of saying, where you have these different parts of the franchise all kind of being celebrated in this movie, and I think. There's a little something for everybody here because the franchise is so big at this point that everybody's kind of in at different parts that I think there's something here for a lot of people. Maybe not everybody, but for a lot of people, this movie offers something, right? So basically, 
he confronts her. She gets away. And as they're, as they're making their way out, William Afton shows up. He's in the, um, I think it's Springlock Bonnie at this point. It's the, it's the golden rabbit suit that we see William Afton. So always tied to like Springlock, uh, the Springlock suit. So he confronts Mike. They kind of get in. He's got a knife. He's, he's, it's a cool scene. Him appearing. I think the suit looks all right. I think it's pretty good. I think the, the job's done well. Matthew Lillard is such a good Michael Afton, in my opinion. Um, I think it's really well done. The scene goes kind of fast, but he confronts Mike. He seems to have extra strength in the suit, kind of tosses him around like it's nothing. Um, and that's not a big deal at all. But eventually he's confronted by his daughter. Vanessa shows up actually and actually challenges him and says she's not going to let him hurt another girl, in this case, Abby. He's not going to let her take her. He's not going to let her have her. And then he confronts her. He ends up stabbing her, his own daughter, um, and hurting her. And in the process, though, the drawings that were on the board behind him, the ones that we already know that Abby can kind of communicate through drawings, she changes one of the drawings that shows the yellow rabbit is the friends of all the animatronics, and he kind of controls them through this drawing. Like They think, honestly, the animatronics do, the ones that are in the pizzeria, they think that he the yellow rabbit is their friend, right? So they, they do what he says. They do what William Afton says. They, they kind of act on his behalf. And she takes the drawing, the main drawing down where it shows the yellow rabbit is her friend. And she changes the drawing. She shows instead that the yellow rabbit stabbed them. He's the killer. He's the one who killed you guys, right? And it kind of changes their mind. And now they turn on him. And it's kind of that cool scene where you see in that mini game of one of the games where, you know, William Afton is confronted by the animatronics and then his spring locks go off their trigger slowly piercing into him pinching him down i think this could have been a little more gruesome i think if they had just gone all out on some of the blood because while the games are in this pixel format a lot like you see it in little mini games where moments like this would happen and yeah since our pixels are not super graphics it's just pixels but the message is there it's much more visceral there than it is in the scene um the spring locks going into william are they're kind of soft like it's cool it's a cool scene but it's not like violent it kind of slowly happens it kind of slowly watches him get destroyed um still cool though it's still cool i still liked it he goes down uh he does that kind of cheesy line which i don't hate i know i know people kind of hate it um i don't hate it you know that i always come back line he has to say that somewhere right like it's william afton everybody knows what the franchise is like he has to say that's just one of those catchphrases I, i don't know if that's where they would have put it maybe at the end when he's twitching in the thing later, but whatever, I don't put it somewhere. I think that he had to say it though. Um, so he puts his hat back on. I think the idea is he's aware that death in this universe he lives in, um, isn't the end. A lot of cases, especially since he's seen it happen to all the kids that he's killed and put back in the suits. I think he knows that he's not gonna, it's not the end for him. He'll come back. Um, the line's kind of silly, but I, I think it's kind of cool. So basically he gets he gets crushed in his suit. The animatronics kind of drag him away. We're coming to the end here of the movie. Um, the animatronics kind of drag him away into the back, lock him in the back cellar. He's just got that twitching scene that's in the uh, that's in the mini games as well, where he's just kind of twitching in the back room, which is kind of cool. I like that. I like that's well done. Um, again, it's not it's not super gritty. I think it could have been a little more gritty. Um, him being bleeding to death back there i think if the if the premise of the of the idea of your soul being trapped in these suits or or the agony right i think there needs to be some actual agony there and it didn't seem like in a lot of these cases that it didn't seem like there was enough agony like he didn't seem like he was that mad he didn't seem like he was suffering that much um but i get it it's it's got to please a big audience the the gist is there right so the door's locked on him. That's all we see the kids. We see Mike and Abby fast forward a little bit. Um, Vanessa's in the hospital and Mike and Abby go visit her in the hospital. I mean, they're they're good with her now. We, we kind of know she's not a bad person. She may be the daughter of a bad person, but she did help when it came down to it. And when it mattered, she did show up to help. So they go and see her in the hospital. She's not awake yet. She doesn't speak to them. And that kind of wraps up the movie, right? Um, Abby talks about she doesn't like that the animatronics are going to be left in the pizzeria on their own and she wants to go visit him one day. Obviously, he's like, oh, I don't know about that. Like, they kind of tried to kill you, right? Um, but he doesn't say it's not off the table and kind of set up with a little bit of 
the setup for when we eventually get a sequel because they're this movie did so well it will definitely get a sequel i don't think that that's you know a mystery so with all that being said long-winded here i think we're going a little bit longer than i typically do because i want this kind of be more of a discussion here i think with all that being said i thought it was a good movie i don't think it was um the best horror movie out there i thought it was pretty good though i think for 2023 we had lots of choices this year i think it was the one i was most excited for just because i am kind of uh a fan of this franchise like everybody else it's not anything unique on my part um just it was something that i really was looking forward to and i wasn't disappointed particular that entrance with all the pixel art that was so good that was such a good entrance i really liked that um so if i was going to give a rating to this to this movie um like everything i review on this channel i'm kind of biased because right now i'm picking things that i liked things that i enjoyed so i think if i if i had to rate it I don't know, maybe like an eight and a half, a nine, or probably an eight, if I'm being genuine. I think anywhere in that range, you're right. So let's just say eight out of 10. It's a good movie. It could be better. It could have more jump scares, in my opinion. I know nobody's ever said that, but I think it would have been fun here. Have a little more like tension, like you play in the games to give you those little scares, at least initially. Uh, not the stupid Bloom Boy scares. Those are dumb. Um, I think that would have helped a little bit. I think make it a little more graphic like the scenes the animatronics everything is beautiful it's so perfect like puppets are great right setting is great the actors great everything's good the problem i had though is that it's so pg it's so not scary right and i know that the games are like that too it's not something that's new it's just you had a chance to make it a little more graphic i know you would have sacrificed a little bit of the rating and a little bit of the money you would have made but there's parts that I felt like fell a little weak, right? Um, that would have made it a little better. Maybe it would have bumped it up a little more, but eight's not bad. I think that's pretty good. I think that's where I feel comfortable putting it. As far as blood and scares are concerned, I think for the scary meter here, this is not a scary movie. There's no point in this movie where I don't think who, it doesn't even matter who's watching it. You're not going to find yourself being like, oh, this is scary. I mean, I watched this uh, with my wife. She doesn't like scary movies at all. Not a fan. And it was nothing. It was nothing to her. It's not bad. So it's like a one. If I have to, because I can't give it a zero, right? It's like a one on the screen. It's nothing. Um, same thing with with blood. There's no blood. There's not, I don't even think you see a scratch in this movie. It's nothing. Like there's some mild, mild blood. I think it's like a one on the bloody meter too. So really we're talking about like, it's mild horror. There's nothing here. There's nothing you need to be concerned about. You might enjoy this as not being a fan of the Five Nights franchise, maybe. Um, I think it's still fun. I think you might still like it just as like nostalgia from that time period if, if you're a little older or just wanting to understand what it's all about without having to invest time reading the million books that are out for Five Nights or playing the million games that are out. This might be a fun way just to be like, oh, what's that all about? You know, I've heard about it. Um, but as a fan, I think you're also gonna enjoy it, right? There's still enough references here, probably way more than I'm aware of. Um, there's always something here for you to look at too. So I think all in all, Anybody can watch this and anybody will have a good time. Um, I think I think that about sums up my thoughts for that. I think um, just take a chance to go watch it if you haven't watched it, right? And uh, I think that about sums up my thoughts. That's my bit. Uh, just let me know what you guys think. If you have any interesting takes on this, you can uh, put it in the comments. I'm trying to respond to those as much as I can. Uh, if you guys noticed anything or if there's anything you want me to uh, take a look at, just let me know, okay? Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next story. Have a good day.